Hi, my name is Nathan Hara. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Geneva. And I'm going to talk to you about the statistical significance of signals in gradual velocity data. And the idea is to detect exoplanets and I use some mathematical tools for that. Um, this lecture is aimed at uh, PhD students and uh, postdocs, but also graduate students who are interested in the analysis of radial velocity data. Okay, so the context uh, is the following. You have radial velocity data on a given star, and you know from the physics that if there is a planet around this star, due to the Doppler effect, you should see in the data periodic changes. Um, if the planet is circular, you would have a sinusoidal variation of the uh, radial velocity. If the planet is eccentric, you will have a periodic uh, variation which, is, which has a slightly different shape. And um, so if you detect that kind of variation in the RV, then you would have detected the planet. Problem is that the data is corrupted by noise, the photon noise, instrumental and stellar noises, which are more or less complicated and which introduce variations uh, that, that are not necessarily due to planets. And you want to know if the variation you, you're seeing is sufficient so that you can claim that there is something and if that something is a planet. <clears throat> so the situation you're in is basically this one. You have a time series of radial velocity. Um, you have a different observation times. For each observation, you have a value of the radial velocity and nominal error bars, which are provided by your data reduction software. The general question is what information this RV data set gives you on the star and on its planets? What, what does this RV data set teach you? And we are going to narrow it down to a more specific question, which is how to assess the confidence in a detection of a planet, or at least in a detection of a signal around the star of interest. And we will see that uh, the significance assessment is a very important step of uh, answering that question, but it's not the only one. Um, so I'm going to talk about the definition of statistical significance on also on common significance metrics that are used in the exoplanet literature. Um, how is statistical significance included in the global decision process on whether you think you have a planet or not? Um, also, I'll, I'll do a couple of discussions on various aspects of the RVs. And I'll start with some remarks that are, um, I will define statistical significance in a certain sense. And if you want to define it in another sense, that's up to you. Uh, also that the analysis of RV is a large and evolving field and I'm not going to talk about everything that's happening in that field. Uh, and also I will not talk about simultaneous analysis of RV and photometry. The first thing is, what is the definition of statistical significance? <clears throat> so uh, I will use the notation uh, of the data. I will need to refer to the data a lot and I'm going to denote it by Y. Uh, so Y mathematically, it's a vector. It has N components and each component is the radial velocity measurement at a certain time time ti, y equal one to n that you can um, arrange in um, an increasing order. So the definition I'm going to use for the statistical significance is basically a function that um, takes in input your data and retrieves a positive real number. And the higher uh, the number is, the, the more confidence it should give you in the detection of uh, a signal. And also, uh, we will define a threshold alpha. So if that function is greater than alpha, then a signal will be claimed. Like, uh, you will say, I have detected a signal. And if your function is below that threshold, then no detection is claimed, which doesn't mean that you have claimed an absence of detection. Um, so questions about this, what is a signal? What do I mean by that? How to choose? M, how to choose alpha, so the significance metric, and uh, the threshold. And I'll 
also mention a question which is very, very important, which is how to make sure you actually have computed uh, this significance metric. Um, because uh, maybe this number is very hard to estimate, you will need a numerical method, and uh, you need to make sure that this numerical method is retrieving that number, otherwise you will base your analysis on something that is wrong. So, so for you to see uh, maybe a little more clearly what I'm talking about, here is an example, which is the periodogram. So the principle of the periodogram is that I'm considering one period, and for this given period, I'm considering a sinusoidal function, and I'm going to fit it to the data, which here is a pure sign uh, evenly sampled. And so if um, I have a good fit of the data, then the value of the periodogram is high. If I don't have a good fit of the data, it is low. I'm going to come back to what is high and low um, in a more precise manner. And so you see that uh, if you have the correct uh, period, then you have a perfect fit. The periodogram is equal to one. And here you can't fit anything with that period and the periodogram is equal to zero. Note that you have also two other peaks which fit perfectly the data, uh, which are not the true period of the signal, uh, which are called aliases. And I talk briefly about it. Okay. So now, if you have noise plus, plus missing data, uh, the periodogram is more likely to look like this. So here I, I plot red stems where I injected the true planets, but really you don't know if there are planets here. So if you compute the periodogram and you see something like this, would you say that 0.3 is high enough so that you can claim that there is a, a signal? Here, there is a, that is a real data set from HAPS that you will analyze uh, actually in the hands-on session. And I have a very strong peak here at uh, five days. It has the power of 0.32 approximately. And is it high enough so that you can claim that there is a, um, a signal here that you are sure that it's not noise? Well, that's what we are going to talk about here, but not only on the periodogram. Okay. Okay, so to understand the common significance metrics in the RV literature, uh, we will start with the probabilistic framework. Um, your data is modeled as a sum of a deterministic function plus a noise where uh, the noise is a stochastic variable uh, following a certain distribution. You don't necessarily want to fix this distribution in advance. You might say that the noise belongs to a family of distributions which you don't know, and you parameterize, uh, I mean, you don't know exactly which distribution in this family, and you parameterize this family with uh, parameters eta. Uh, more precisely, in the case of RV, the model is a sum of k Keplerian functions. k is the total number of planets. And each Keplerian function represents the signal of one planet, <coughs> uh, parameterized by the eccentricity, our um, semi amplitude, period, argument of period strum, and um, initial min and omega. Here I've added a generic function, uh, g of beta, which represents other effects such as upsets between instruments, uh, trends, or uh, activity models. Um, the noise is this part of the model. Uh, it's something you have a partial information on. It's, uh, if you know that it cannot be anything because it follows a certain, uh, some, some values of the noise will be highly improbable because it follows a certain noise distribution. Uh, but you won't know exactly at, uh, a given, uh, at a given measurement what is going to be the level of the noise. In most analysis of reliability data, the noise is assumed to be Gaussian, at least after having corrected for uh, outliers. Here are some examples of uh, RV signals. Uh, this deterministic part here is represented in blue, and these two blue curves are examples of signals that might be generated 
as a sum of Keplerian functions. Um, here in uh, orange, I've uh, generated uh, mock data, which is uh, the value of the blue curve plus uh, some noise. And here you don't know uh, everything about that noise, but you might know that it follows a certain distribution. So you, you know that it's going to be distributed according to, or at least you assume it's going to be distributed according to a certain uh, distribution. So here is the histogram of the value of the noise. It's uh, here I generated the Gaussian noise of mean zero and variance sigma squared, and you see that it has generated the, the noise for this distribution. Uh, an important part of the modeling uh, is the notion of likelihood and priors. The likelihood is the probability of the data knowing the parameters of your model. Prior distribution is what you expect your parameters are without uh, seeing any data prior to seeing uh, the data that you will analyze. And the posterior distribution is the distribution of these parameters once you have seen the data. So it's this is refining what your prior assumption about the, the, the parameters. And this is linked to these two quantities through the base formula, which is a very, very important formula in probability. Um, the posterior is equal to the likelihood times the prior divided by the normalization, which is the integral of the prior times the likelihood over all possible values of the parameters of your model. Um, to understand a little bit better what this formula means, uh, I like to um, make an analogy analogy with the communication theory in which you have an emitter sending a message through a noisy channel to some, someone. Uh, here the, in the analogy, uh, you can think of a planetary system with all the its parameters like a word. Um, P of theta is the probability distribution of words. So for example, the probability distribution of words in the English language where some words are more probable than others. And uh, here in the, in the analogy, it would be the distribution of planetary systems. <clears throat> in communication theory, an emitter sends you a word through this noisy channel. And here, the noisy channel is the instrument and the sampling strategy that you have. Uh, the data that you receive is a kind of noisy encryption of the original signal, which is uh, theta. And uh, P of theta is the probability that having received your data, uh, your RV, the true values of the parameters of the planet, uh, of the planetary system, are, um, are theta. So you see that if you have something which has a very low prior, in order for it to have a, a high posterior, you need to have a very, very li high likelihood. So if, uh, if a rare event, uh, so to, to claim a rare event, you need a very high likelihood. I'll point also that other interpretations of probabilities are, are possible, uh, such like uh, subjective measure of belief. And that's fine. Uh, you, you will see that it can be useful uh, to interpret some certain quantities. Uh, in the case of the RV analysis, the likelihood is like this. You have uh, the deterministic part and, um, and the noise. The noise is question with uh, with a covariance V so that the likelihood can be written like this. And T denotes the matrix transpose. Um, the priors are uh, usually assumed to be independent of each other. Um, so the, the joint prior on semi-amplitude eccentricity and so on is the product of these priors. This is obviously not a representation of what we know uh, in in real life, because uh, we know that the, the same amplitude and the period, for example, are, are linked. Uh, but this is a simplif simplifying assumption. Usually, the priors on K and P are log uniform. The prior on E follows the beta distribution or uh, is taken as uniform. And um, the priors on the angles are uniform on 0 to pi. So these are typical choices. <clears throat> 
Um, something I will talk about a lot in the rest of the talk is the notion of model. And what I call a model is a couple of prior unlikelihood defined on a certain parameter space uh, theta. So the question we will ask in the rest of the presentation is uh, mostly of the form, do we favor a K plus one planet model over a K planet model? So is it justified to add a planet in your model so that you explain your data? So then you have this definition of the likelihood for a K planet model where you have at most K planets. And the, the space of parameters of your model parameterize all the combinations of K planets. Okay, <clears throat> so let's talk about significance. Let's start with a naive approach. So you have a likelihood, you have a parameter space, and you want to find the parameters such that the likelihood is maximum. So you maximize on all the possible parameters of your model, the probability of the data. And in the case where the noise model is uh, Gaussian and fixed, so that the parameters eta are, are fixed, then uh, the maximum likelihood is, is uh, equivalent to the chi-square. So for a given model M, you will have one metric of, of value of this model, which is among the parameters of this model, there is one function which fits, fits better the data than the other. And uh, so the, the distance between this uh, function and the data is what I, uh, is my case squared and it's, an, it's a metric uh, of uh, agreement with the data. And um, the question is, if one of the model fits better, which means it's closer to the data, the chi squared is smaller. Does it mean that I, I can favor the model uh, which fits better every time? And the answer is no, because if your model is increasingly complex, then it's gonna fit better and better the data, but it doesn't mean that it has to be favored. To illustrate this point, I've um, generated an example. Uh, so to keep things simple, I've just generated a polynomial as a function of time with a certain degree, plus months. And um, I want to know what is the degree of the periodogram that has been generated. So I fit a periodogram of order two, six, and 12, and you see that the, the higher is the order, the better is the fit to the data. And when you look at the chi-squared for a zeros order polynomial, one, one, first order polynomial second and so on, you see that it's always decreasing. It's kind of stabilizing at, a, at some point and we'll come back to that later, but it's always decreasing. So the fact that the case squared is dec decreasing is not, cannot be used alone to select models. So now we are entering the actual families of methods which are used in the, the context of radar velocity data. I don't expect you to to read uh, everything uh, while I'm talking. So you can pause and look at the references in, in there. Uh, there are, to me, uh, three categories. The first one is uh, the category of periodograms plus what we call a false alarm probability. The second category, the base factor. And finally, you have um, other methods uh, which are kind of hybrid or non-parametric methods it doesn't mean that the fact that they are not uh, all uh, used a lot uh, doesn't mean that they are not interesting, especially uh, the non-parametric uh, methods. And I'm putting this one into parentheses because it's not exactly a, a significance uh, assessment met method, but it's related to the detection of uh, planetary signals anyway. Okay, so let's start with the periodogram. Uh, we here adopt the view of the periodogram the value of this paper series, and which is also adopted in the lead et al. 2020. The basic idea is to compare the likelihoods of the base model H and the model K nu, which is H plus periodic component at nu. And you are going to do this comparison for a grid of frequencies nu. H is uh, including your noise model, it's including maybe a trend, maybe uh, planets that you already think uh, you have detected. And you want to see if you can you scan for an uh, additional um, periodic component. 
one definition that you can adopt is uh, something which is proportional to the difference of the log maximum likelihood of k nu and h and so, so for, for a given frequency nu and you're going to compute this for a grid of frequencies. Uh, when the noise model is fixed, uh, you, when the noise is Gaussian as is assumed in the context of our lead data in general, then uh, maximum likelihood is equivalent to least square so that this difference is equivalent to a difference of k squared. And here you can normalize it uh, by the k-squared of your base model so that your periodogram is between zero and one. One very important thing to note here is that there is no notion of the prior whatsoever so that you cannot include an information you have um, in uh, prior to seeing the data. You, you could make a periodogram in, uh, as a difference of posterior uh, distribution, but it's usually not uh, what not what is done. If you define the periodogram as uh, before, so as a difference of k square normalized by the k square of your base model, it's between zero and one, and this is the definition I have adopted to compute the periodogram that I've shown at the beginning of this presentation. And the question that remains and that we are going to treat next is: Okay, so now point thirty-two. Is it sufficiently high so that I can claim a detection? To assess whether the peak is sufficiently high so that you can claim the detection of the signal, we uh, introduce the notion of false alarm probability. And uh, this goes as follows. The maximum value of the periodogram that I compute on the data is P max. And if the signal was just described by model H, the FAP would be the probability that in that case, I would have a peak of the periodogram higher than Pmax. So here my, my, my Pmax is 0 0.32, 33. And what would be, the, if the signal was just H, if it was pure noise, how often would I have a peak which is above this threshold? And that's the, prob the false alarm probability. And, so, and you would say that the signal is, is significant if the false alarm probability is below this threshold. Or since I define the significance metric as something which is increasing, uh, you can define, for example, minus log of the FAP as, as a significance metric and say that you have a detection if you are above minus log of your threshold. And uh, usually we take in RV 0.1% uh, for alpha. How would you compute the FAP in practice? Uh, so numerically, you can generate many systems with the base model and compute the empirical distribution of the values of the maximum peak, but that's very costly and that's not really efficient. The, another way to do is to, to do it analytically. And uh, the analytical formula for the FAP uh, has been derived by uh, Baluef or Delil in, in various situations. So depending on your periodogram definition, you can uh, use uh, one of these. Uh, the calculation is actually fairly complicated. It's, com it's based on the theory of extreme values of stochastic processes, and especially the Rice formula. And it's very fast and accurate. Uh, so for, especially for the FAPs which are of interest, the low FAPs, um, the, approx the analytical approximation is uh, really excellent. How would you uh, use the periodogram to detect planets in your radial velocity data? And so you, you compute your periodogram, you look at the maximum peak. If it is significant, then you add this peak to your base model or you fit it and you compute the periodogram and the residuals. You find another peak. If it's significant, you add it to your base model and so on uh, until you find a signal which is not significant. Um, so, the, so some comments about this is uh, the FAP allows you to reject a null hypothesis. So rejecting a null hypothesis doesn't mean that you accept a planet because first a significant periodogram peak is not necessarily due to a planet. It might be correlated noise, it might be another periodic effect like 
for example, if you find something at 365 days, it probably has to do with the instrument. Um, so be careful with the interpretation. And also something I want to stress is that even though a periodogram scans the period, nowhere the fab definition does mean that you have to accept um, a planet at the period where the peak happens. And so here it's an example of, a, of um, an unpleasant situation. Uh, I've generated three planets uh, here in red. The, their periods are, are represented in red and they all have the same amplitude. And I just put a little bit of noise, but it's here it's really not what's framing the result. And the maximum peak of the periodogram does not occur on any of the planets that I that I have put um, that I have set in input. So be careful with your uh, uh, with uh, the conclusion that you have on the periodogram. Uh, second method is the base factor. Uh, I'll just uh, remind you that uh, this is our model of radial velocity data and the likelihood is written like this and the, the priors are uh, written like this and uh, to define the base factor first we need to define what is called the evidence or the marginal likelihood so you take the integral of the likelihood times the prior on all possible combinations of um, parameters in your model with uh, k planets and uh, so the evidence automatically penalizes the models that are too complicated. Uh, I, I try to say a word in my live talk uh, about this, but for, for, for now on, just bear in mind that just because your model is more, is more complicated, it doesn't mean that the evidence is going to be higher. So it's, it's not the same situation as the case squared. And to compute, uh, to detect an exoplanet, you can compute the base factor, which is the ratio of the evidences of uh, a K plus one planet model and a K planet model. And the highest the base factor is, the higher is the evidence for model NK plus one. And usually the significance threshold is taken as uh, 150, which uh, comes from the Jeffreys uh, scale. And we'll, we'll come back to that value uh, shortly. Uh, something I want to bring your attention to is that you really, really need to be careful with your numerical methods to compute the evidence. This might be a huge integral and it's very compute it's computationally very challenging to, to, uh, to compute. So you can use different techniques, uh, and this is something parallel tampering, but this is like 0.1% um, of uh, what exists, even less. And if you want to see uh, an overview of different techniques uh, for the context of exoplanets, look at this reference, Nelson et al. 2020. As also, uh, when you are computing the evidence, don't just give one value and, and that's it. Uh, you have to use convergence diagnostics for your algorithms and make sure that uh, your um, your numerical scheme is converging. Maybe look at the chain of two correlation when you're using MCMC uh, for Monte Carlo Markov chain. And um, when you compute the evidences, provide numerical uncertainties. For example, make several runs of your uh, computational methods to compute the evidence. You, you, you try it uh, five times, 10 times, and you look at the variability of the different estimates. And you provide it in your paper to uh, to, to show that your numerical uncertainties is below the threshold of detection. I mean, that, that it doesn't change your, your decision on the data. Uh, the evidence, uh, as I said, is complicated to, to compute, so you can use approximations. The first one is uh, called the Laplace approximation that you can see in uh, this reference, Cassandra Tay, very nice reference on the base factor. Um, so it basically works when you have one mode in your posterior uh, so that you have one region of your posterior uh, which, is, which concentrates most of the probability mass. Uh, 
And if you want to do a, an even quicker but rougher approximation, you can use the Bayesian information criterion, which is which satisfies for very large n uh, this relationship. Um, and so you see that when the evidence is high, it means that the big has to be low. But to be low, you want the number of free parameters in your model to be low also. And if you are if you add parameters uh, to your model, this number increases, your big increases, so it decreases the likelihood of the, the, the likelihood not in a technical sense, but uh, the, probabil the probability that your model is uh, correct. L uh, going back to the example I gave earlier, here is my uh, fit, polynomial fit of the data. And I compute the Bayesian information criterion as a function of the polynomial degree. Uh, since it's kind of flat here, I made a zoom from uh, the value three, and you see that the minimum is attained at four. And in fact, in that case, I did generate the data uh, with the polynomial of order four. So in that case, the big is uh, selecting the appropriate number. Also, uh, something to mention is that uh, once, if, if you have computed the evidence, and uh, uh, something tempting is to compute directly the posterior number, the posterior probability of the number of planets. So what is the probability of having k planets? Well, it's given by the base formula, and some authors uh, do compute these kind of uh, things. And um, you see that if you, assume that your only possibilities are just k or k plus one planets and there are no other possibilities whatsoever and they have a prior probability, each of them which uh, is equal, then the posterior probability of having k planets is written like this. So it's one divided by one plus the base factor. So uh, the base factor of 150 basically means that the probability of having only k planets is below 1% and the probability of having k plus one planets and the, uh, symmetrically is above 99%. But in real life, you have many more uh, possible models than k or k plus one model planets. So uh, you can't uh, just say that you have an over 99% probability of having detected any other planets discussion on some important points. Um, the FAP and the Bay factors themselves, they compare K versus K plus one planets, but they do not tell you where the planet is in some sense, and in particular at which period. So you need, uh, your analysis needs to be combined with a periodogram or a study of the posterior distribution of the period to see whether you privilege strongly um, uh, a certain region of the posterior for the for the planet that you have, because it doesn't make sense to just say, well, I have one more planet, but I don't know if it's an Earth at 100 days or a, a Jupiter at, uh, at 60 days. In practice, uh, you will have a region of the posterior where the, the power is co is condensed, and if it's not the case, then you you need to discuss it uh, thoroughly. Um, some questions also on what I said, like why using probability theory at all? Uh, wh why did we use uh, the, this framework? Um, what is the influence of the model? Um, so if I change my priors, if I change my likelihood, would I have uh, an, a different answer? Uh, how do FAP and base factor compare? And can we go a little further? For the probability theory, there is a, a very nice answer, which is provided by Cox theorem. I'm not going into the details, but it states essentially that any metric of belief, any quantitative measure of belief that satisfies intuitive properties of uh, belief update is um, basically the theory of probability. Uh, something to mention that Cox proof as they are, are not completely correct, and you have a, a counterexample, but you have uh, a, a rigorous proof made in uh, this uh, reference. And something that I mentioned also is that uh, um, people sometimes talk about the Occam's razor principle, like you select models which are um, not too complicated. The simplest the model is, the better. 
but in fact, it's a consequence of probability theory, open It's not an, it's not a principle that comes from elsewhere and that is applied to probability theory. It's embedded it's in, in the probability theory. So you could argue that you want to reason well, so you use probability theory, so you have the open razor principle. Um, <clears throat> so what is the influence of the noise model? So to discuss this, I'm going to dive into a little bit more, uh, I'm going to dive a little bit more into the definition of the noise model. Um, so here uh, I'm parameterizing the covariance matrix like this. In all the analysis in radio velocity data or almost all, uh, the noise is assumed to be stationary, which means that the covariance structure of the noise depends only on the time difference between measurements. So it doesn't, if you take two measurements, it doesn't matter if they are in March and, and June, what, what only matters is whether they are separated by one, two, three, four months or days. Um, one classic form for the covariance structure is this one. So it looks scary, but in fact, it's pretty intuitive. These terms are just about the nominal uncertainties and uh, a jitter, like you, you, you think that you have an extra source of noise maybe because of the star. And this one is a quasi-periodic camel, which means that it's going to have a periodic structure and it's, this periodic structure is going to be damped over time. These are examples of uh, this function, which depends only on the delta t, so the, the, the difference of time between two measurements. And as time goes, so in, in that example, I've uh, selected uh, 25 days. And um, as time goes, uh, you see the, a periodicity of uh, 25 days in the data. And you have this term, which damps the amplitude of this periodicity with here a time scale of 50 days. The interpretation of this parameter is a little bit trickier. And in fact, it's a shape parameter. So if you take it to be one or 0.5, then you would have different shapes of, uh, of correlation uh, as a function of time. Something you can do also is to completely forget about this term and just uh, take this one, which would be just uh, an exponent, um, a Gaussian correlation pattern. Okay, so now to discuss the influence of the noise model on the results you are, you are having, I'm going to take a simplified example from uh, Delhi et al. 2020. So I'm selecting a true, uh, a true noise model, which has a true time scale, which is given by the rows. And I'm assuming another time scale. I'm doing the analysis with, uh, with the noise that has other properties. So assuming that you have just the nominal observations, so the, 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 the input noise is white, and you assume that the noise has a characteristic time scale of one day, then you see that the average periodogram that you would get is dumped in the low region. So it means that assuming uh, a correlated noise while there is just white noise is going to decrease the power at low frequency. It's going to act against detecting planets in that range. And if you use a monthly uh, decay time scale of 30 days, then you see that basically uh, it completely kills the amplitude of, uh, of the periodogram in those regions. Um, conversely, if the true noise model is, uh, is correlated, but you use uh, a correlation uh, which is too small, then you will have on average a lot of power in the low frequency region. And so you will detect a lot of false positives in the low frequency region. The sensitivity to priors, I'm not going to talk too much about this. Uh, just point to you that the broader is your uh, prior on the semi-amplitude, the more it penalizes the models with more planets. Uh, this is discussed in those references, in that case, in the, in the context of eccentricity, but uh, I'm not going into the details here. Comparison of fat and base factor. 
uh, first thing I'm doing is I'm considering the evidence challenge of Nelson et al. 2020. You have six systems generated with at most two planets. These systems are dominated by stellar activity, but the, the, the correlation of the, the the correlation matrix has a fixed correlation pattern. You just has a, you, you just have a three G term in the model. And the objective of this challenge is well, was to compute the evidence of zero, one, and two planets model to see if different numerical schemes would yield the same value of the evidence or not. So what I've done here is I've selected the periods with the L1 periodogram. So it's, it's not a truly Bayesian framework or truly periodogram framework, but uh, I, then I'm comparing the base factor with the Laplace approximation centered around this period and the FAPs of this period. Here I also, so in abscissa I have the log 10 of the FAP and ordinate I have the log 10 of the odds ratio. <clears throat> On top of that, I print two thresholds, which are common thresholds. Uh, the red threshold corresponds to, to very moderate evidence in favor of adding a planet and uh, and the, the green threshold corresponds to strong evidence for uh, adding a planet. You see that in fact in those regions delimited by the red um, uh, the red lines or the green lines in fact you would have the same detections with the odds ratio which is actually a version of the base factor a little bit modified and um, and the false alarm probability. So you could say that here I used the L1 periodogram and uh, this seems a bit convoluted to, comp to, to compare the two metrics. And so I did another uh, simulation which will uh, allow us to also discuss the importance of the detection threshold. So I generate a hand um, a thousand circular systems with zero to two planets with a uniform prior on the number of planets, uh, 80 observation times from a real system. And I compute the FAPs and the base factors as, so I, I choose the planets that I detect as a function of uh, a certain threshold on the base factor and on the log 10 FAPs. And when I'm when I'm counting the wrong number of planets, so either I have a false negative or a false positive, I count it as one mistake, which is here the ordinate of these uh, of, um, of these plots. So, as a function of the the threshold that I use to detect planets for the FAP or the base factor, I compute the number of mistakes that I make. In both cases, you have uh, a sort of U curve which is due to the fact that if your detection threshold is too low, then you have too many false positives. In too many cases, you think that you have uh, uh, detected a planet. And uh, if, you, if your detection threshold is too stringent, then you have uh, false negatives, which means that there are planets, but you were too demanding, you wanted too strong evidence, and you, you will say that they are, not plan they, they are not planets while they were there. Uh, something interesting, also what I've plotted in uh, orange uh, in that plot is the number of mistakes you get by taking the posterior, the maximum of the posterior of the number of planets, uh, as I mentioned earlier. And um, something interesting to note is that if you take a log threshold of uh, a, log, uh, a base factor of 150 or a, a FAP of 10 to the minus three, in one case you get 45 mistakes, in the other one you get 49. So here, slight advantage for the base factor, but you need to keep in mind that the base factor knows exactly the prior model which I used to generate the data. In real life, you don't know what the true prior is. So you would get uh, something which is uh, not as good as in that case. And so thanks to Nicolas Unger who helped me with uh, computing the evidence of the systems. And here the evidence are computed with polycord. Uh, so these are real evidence, there are no approximations. Here. 
Uh, so a word of conclusion, uh, I think that the base factor allows you to search for several times at the same time. It averages uh, your, your significance over noise parameters, but it relies on a certain model and it's com computationally costly and the conversions might be tricky to obtain. So that's a quantity which has very nice interpretable properties that you want to compute, but beware that like, um, take the time to make sure that you have computed actually the value of the integral. Um, on the other hand, the periodograms are computationally, computationally cheap and very stable. You don't have convergence issues. It's kind of a versatile framework, but it doesn't compute uh, exactly what you would want, which is the probability of the number of planets scanning the data. Um, also, it allows you to see the data in some ways, uh, which is harder when you look at uh, the, the, the posteriors of the distribution, at least uh, to me. It's a, it's a nice way to, to see what's in the data. It's kind of dangerous as we will see, but it's also, it also allows to diagnose unexpected effects, which might be nice because your model is not perfect. Uh, going further uh, from that framework, something that you can do is to model the RV data along with other spectroscopy indicators like the WHM, the software span. And you, you can have um, a framework in which you have a Gaussian process and its derivative, which are simultaneously modeling the, the prime time series of interest and other time series. So look at John Settle 2017, for example. Also, you can fit radial velocities and photometric data uh, together. You can look at this very nice paper by Jason Eastman. Um, and here, I'm not going to talk about it because that's kind of a different subject. Uh, how is significance assessment included in the analysis? Bear in mind that you apply your significance analysis to a certain time series. And uh, you might think that this time series is the, is the raw data, but the raw data is actually uh, the, the, the flux you get on your CCDs. And uh, you obtain the time series through many, many steps of data reduction pipeline. And if you change that data reduction pipeline, then you might change your conclusion on the data. As an example here, these are the stars observed by uh, the SOFI spectrograph at uh, the OHP in, uh, in France, uh, the, the observatory OHP in France. And these are stars which are very quiet. And the, all these points do not correspond to the same star, but to time series which have been made uh, so that their mean is equal to zero. Um, and you can see that you have strong patterns in this data. And you can link it, in fact, to uh, upgrades of the instruments and uh, some events that have happened uh, to, to the instrument. So in fact, this trend, you are going to see it on all the data sets. So whether you correct it or not, you are going to find different signals and, uh, the, and some of them will be significant, but if you don't correct for it, so some of them will be significant because there are instrumental effects that were not accounted for in the model. Also, uh, be aware that you have to, you will choose uh, a certain model, especially a noise model. And our model of uh, stellar activity is, for the moment, kind of coarse. A lot of people are trying to improve it, and, and that's a very active field of research and very crucial one. Um, but so keep in mind that our models are wrong and they might be a little too simplistic. To convince you of that, let's look at the, the Harps North Sun data. It's a nice figure by Amélie Mortier, where in blue you see the expect you would the, the effect you would expect from the Earth. And you see that in the Sun raw Sun data, you have a lot of effects, uh, and it's clearly more complicated than just a Gaussian process with a, a certain a quasi parametric problem. Uh, so also after the significance evaluation, once you have your, your significance uh, estimate, be critical about what you find. Uh, this is an example that I detail in a day's tutorial where uh, 
I fit the known data on 55 concrete, and there is a very significant signal here in the periodogram. You might think it's a planet, but then you, you need to think twice about, uh, about uh, publishing this as a planet. Another example here, this is also a sort of periodogram where you have planets which are very uh, regularly spaced, and in fact, they are spaced so that they are in a three to two mean motion resonance chain. And if you find signals in a three to two mean motion resonance chain, even if the significance is not necessarily uh, extremely high, this increases your confidence because uh, you would expect that kind of ratio uh, from, uh, from Kepler. For example. On the other hand, beware that coming back over and over and over to your data is dangerous because you might end up finding something because you finally tried this particular model which makes this signal pop. But the more you search, the more you will find something. And this is illustrated by this example where uh, if you search in a very large database, then you end up finding an extremely good correlation between civil engineering doctorates and per capita consumption of mozzarella cheese in the United States. The conclusions. Significance is a way to measure whether a model expressed in a certain mathematical way is supported by the data. It's a very important part of your process because if you don't have significance in any ways, then you cannot publish your planet. So this is a necessary condition. Um, but always consider whether another effect uh, might, have, uh, might introduce a significant signal in your data. May, maybe star activity instrumental effect. So have a critical view on your result. Do not forget that you, your raw data is not raw. And in fact, it comes from a very long data reduction process. So beware of, of that, especially for the low, uh, for, for the low uh, amplitude signals and at long periods where you might have uh, effects that are instrumental effects that are not well corrected. Um, Pay attention to the period selection because your significance metric, the usual significance metrics, give you uh, confidence in adding another planet, but you need to know which planet you're adding. So pay attention to that. And something that comes from my experience of uh, reviewing paper, um, just saying I use the Gaussian process does not magically make your analysis right. So if you use a Gaussian process, be specific about it, uh, describe it thoroughly, justify why you are using this particular form of the Gaussian process, because uh, th this is a tool which is kind of tricky to, to use right. So this is a summary, conclusions. Again, this is a mathematical form of your model, and your model is always wrong, so significant signal is not a planet. Uh, but if your signal is not significant with any objective matrix, then you, metric, you cannot claim a detection, which I think is summed up by uh, the idea that statistical significance is definitely a necessary condition for detection, but it is not a sufficient one. Uh, I've cited quite a few articles in this presentation, and uh, here are the bibliographical records for those. Um, I'm just going to scroll them, and you, you can find them on the slides also, which are available in the Dropbox.